Good fucking morning, everybody. All right, let's see if these slides go. Oh, there we go. Okay, I can see off to the side. So it's fucking mass. We're going to talk about money printing, my favorite topic, because it drowns me in all of the predictions that I make about the markets. And I think a lot of people make a lot of mistakes because they expect the past to be the definitive guide for the future, especially in we're expecting some sort of central bank money printing. And there will be money printing. It's just it will be a bit different this time. So I want to talk about the United States uh, because they're one of the largest offenders uh, in this game. But everybody plays the same game. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's going to happen over the next, I think, three years and why the amount of money printing that's going to happen between now and 2028 is going to dwarf what we saw during the 2020 to 2022 COVID period. So first thing I have up here is uh, a, a movie reference. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. But essentially, the US government ha has an issue, right? They need to sell these bonds. And I'll get into some charts in a minute about why they're actually pretty terrible investments. But it's hard to sell dog shit. And you had to try really, really hard. But thankfully, we have a new salesman in chief who has just come into office. His name is Sec U.S. Secretary Scott Besson. And I think people misinterpret him a bit because they like to talk about how he's a very successful hedge fund manager. He was with George Soros, helped uh, defeat a few different currency pegs, and is obviously extremely knowledgeable about what has to happen economically for the U.S. to succeed, given all the issues that they have. And here's a photo of Besson giving a sales presentation. I'm sure some of you have seen this movie, Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross, and the iconic scene when, uh, I forgot the name of the actor, he's standing up there and telling the salespeople, ABC, always be closing. So what's Scott Besson's job? So every time you see him on TV, imagine he's a used car salesman, and he's selling you something. What is he selling you? Bonds. His job is to sell bonds. His job is to sell bonds because his boss, the U.S. government, needs to finance itself. So why are bonds shitty investments? Well, here in yellow, this is a chart of the total amount of US Treasury debt. And I started it in 2017. And what you can see here is it's indexed at 100. And the supply of debt has gone up by about 80%. And then I index this uh, against the TLT, which is the ETF of um, long-term bond treasuries, divided by the NASDAQ 100. And so if the, if the chart's going down, that means the NASDAQ is outperforming bonds. And so the outperformance of the NASDAQ is about 80% from 2017 until the present. So yes, you might have made money you know, owning bonds on your coupon, but if you put your money in the stock market, you would have made 80% more. Okay, let's look at the same chart versus gold. Similar story. If you had not owned a U.S. Treasury bond and bought gold instead, you would have outperformed by about 80%. Now, obviously, this is not a gold or stock conference. We're here to talk about fucking Bitcoin. So what is this performance versus Bitcoin? And it's even more dramatic. It's about like 99% you have outperformed by buying Bitcoin versus buying bonds. And so while there are many investment professionals who will stand up and they'll tell you, hey, you know, I think the bond market is going to do well over the next year or two years, what have you, that might be true you might actually make money owning bonds, but you make more money owning other things. And the goal of investing is to maximize the amount of money you make given the current circumstances, and owning government bonds is not a great trade. Now, obviously, this feeds back into my message of this job that Besson has is very difficult because as more investors re read these charts and understand that they're significantly underperforming what they could be making for themselves and their clients by staying in government bonds, then there needs to be more government action in order to make sure that the U.S. government is able to fund itself. So obviously, you know, the new administration, the Trump administration came in and they talked about how the U.S. government has a spending problem. Now here's a chart from the Peterson Institute, and this is up until March of this year. The fiscal year in the United States starts in October. And what we can see here is that even though there's been a lot of effort and rhetoric about the fact that the U.S. government is spending too much money, in fiscal year 2025, 
we're already tracking above fiscal year 2024, which is already a record year for the deficit. Now, obviously, the, in the media, we've been talking a lot about how you know, certain people, and we'll get to that person in a second, are going to rein in government spending by eliminating fraud and abuse. And so we talked about it for a while, and then the protagonist of this effort, the, the Doge, went missing. And we haven't heard from him for, in a while because it's bad politics. Every dollar that the government spends is going into somebody else's pocket. And if you're going to come out here and say we're going to cut trillions of dollars from the deficit, that's obviously going to impact a lot of people and businesses in an adverse fashion. And we saw sort of the negative reaction to this from the media, from individuals. And ultimately, I think the politicians realized, hey, this isn't great politics. Let's call in our attack dog. Let him go off into the sunset and, and run his private company. But what that means is, if they're not going to be able to cut the deficit meaningfully, how do you make the books balance? And recently, Scott Besson has got, got on a media tour and talked about how he is focused on growth. He's all in on growth. And so what does that mean if you're running a massive deficit? That means that you need to get nominal GDP above your cost of interest, which is very difficult to do, unless you're going to up the amount of credit in the economy. So a lot of you in this room are American or spend a lot of time in, in North America. I have lived most half of my and most of my adult life in greater China. And when you live in China, you understand that GDP or growth is just an output of how much credit you want to put into the economy. And so we want to understand what the Trump administration and I think any administration would do given these mathematical facts. We have to understand that this economy depends on credit. And so if you're willing to put more credit into the system, then you'll get any growth target that you'd want. So if Besson says they want 6 or 7% nominal GDP growth, great. How much credit are you going to create? And we want to know how much credit they're going to create because ultimately that is what leads to Bitcoin outperforming every other asset in fiat terms. So how do we outgrow a 7% persistent deficit? What can they do? Usually, the authorities blow another financial bubble. Maybe that's Bitcoin and crypto. Uh, a very accommodative stance from the, the politicians to say, hey, we want the crypto bros and girls to get very wealthy, get pay capital gains taxes, you know, spend a lot of money, and increase uh, economic performance. They could encourage lending by the banking system to real-world economy. That I call this QE for poor people in an essay that I wrote uh, a few months back. And essentially, if the banking system, instead of you know, doing financial engineering, takes its balance sheet and lends to ordinary companies, this produces jobs and economic growth. Now, the problem with both of these things is that there is inflation. Inflation is necessary to delever the balance sheet. And I know it's a dirty word in politics and economics, but inflation is necessary for the government to afford this massive debt pile that it has. So we are going to get inflation, and obviously people in this room understand that Bitcoin is the best hedge against that, but we need to spread this message around the world. Now, recently, uh, I want to talk about a few things. The path to $1 million Bitcoin. And I believe there's three main prongs to this. So the first thing is capital controls versus tariffs. I wrote a recent essay where I delved into the fact that I think tariffs are bad politics, because they encourage goods inflation and empty shelves, and the ordinary Americans don't like that. But you can achieve the same goal of economic rebalancing by using capital controls instead. And so we started to see certain you know, fringe economists, and it will be mainstream soon, talking about how they can rescind certain tax benefits that foreigners have investing into America and take this income and redistribute it either to voters or to buying certain maturity of treasury bonds. The second thing is an exemption of the bank supplemental leverage ratio, which I'll get into in a second. Scott Besson has talked about this on multiple interviews, and he's even turned up the rhetoric recently in recent you know, Bloomberg and Fox News interviews talking about how this ratio, he believes this summer there will be an exemption, just like there was in COVID, for large banks to buy treasuries with infinite leverage. And finally, uh, something that's becoming a lot more uh, energy is uh, the Fannie and Freddie Mac, the government-sponsored entities that will be able to juice the mortgage market with lots of money if they're allowed to once again. 
So let's go into these three horsemen. Foreigners must pay is good politics, right? If you're going to go out to the voters and say, I'm going to give you something, obviously it'd be great if somebody else was paying for it. That's just how politics works around the world. So back in 1984, because the US government had another problem, same problem, how do we get people to buy our debt? And this is at a time when the 30-year treasury is trading at about 12% yield. They said, hey, why don't we exempt uh, foreign owners of bonds from withholding taxes? Now, if you're an American, all the interest that you receive from owning a treasury bond is taxed at a particular rate. I think it's between 20 and 30%. And right now, if you're a foreigner, you don't have to pay that. So there is talk now about rescinding that exemption to do a few things. First, it could raise over a trillion dollars over a decade by basically taxing foreigners on the income that they receive. Now, obviously, if you receive a tax, you're probably not going to want to own a treasury bond. So one thought is, how about we make it that it's very low tax to own a long-term treasury bond, these are the things that Besson has a trouble selling, and very high tax on treasury bills. These are the cash-like instruments that you might own in your money market account. And everybody wants this. Everybody wants a high-yielding cash account. So let's penalize you for owning that, but let you own this long end. And that's a soft form of yield curve control. How do we get demand into the long end from foreigners? Well, it just changed the tax rates. Now, the ultimate problem of this is who's going to replace foreigners as a marginal owner of debt. Now, obviously, that means they're going to print the money to make up for the amount of money that's lost from foreigners not investing in this debt. Other thing, bank buying bonanza. So the supplemental leverage ratio, if you, you know, don't remember anything from this presentation, do please remember this. It's a way for banks to buy bonds with infinite leverage. So there's something called Basel III. It's this very complicated regulation that was put in after the global financial crisis. And it did something sensible. It said, hey, banks, you didn't have a lot of capital. Why don't we make you have more capital? So if I own a bond, I have to put up some of my own equity capital against them. That makes a lot of sense. Well, that means that the US banks will run up into a limit as to how much US Treasury debt they can buy. And remember, Besson has two trillion, if not more, per year of bonds that he needs to sell. And he needs to make sure that somebody can buy these. So if I remove this exemption, it allows commercial banks to buy treasury bonds with infinite leverage. And when they, when they can do that, their profits soar because they pay very low rates on commercial deposits. And obviously, smiling, Jamie Dimon would very much love this to happen. And he has said this on many occasions, that he believes that the banking system needs this exemption. And as I always say, Jamie Dimon gets what Jamie Dimon wants. Something else? Uh, stable coins is obviously a very hot topic these days. If you combine stable coins or US banks issuing dollar stable coins throughout the market that pay no yield with an SLR exemption, they essentially become, become just like Tether. They pay nothing to allow people to invest in these stable coins and use them for transfers. And then they get to take all that money, put it into US Treasury bills, and have no capital charge. And it's essentially infinite profit. So I expect that if this exemption goes through, which I think it will, you're going to see a very concerted effort by the large US banks to issue the orange stable coin because it's a way for them to earn a lot of net interest income. Now this is a tweet or a truth or whatever you want to fucking call it from uh, Trump on Fannie and Freddie. Essentially, these are the organizations that were issuing mortgages during the financial crisis. Before the 2008 financial crisis, they were very profitable. Now, what happens when you free Fannie and Freddie? Essentially, you take them out of conservatorship. Now, this has been a trade that's been talked about you know, for almost two years now. Uh, if you bought it at a dollar, it's probably trading at 11 now, the, these companies on the market. But you take them from conservatorship, they're allowed to take their equi equity capital, issue more debt with an implicit government guarantee, and lever it 33 times. And then they can buy up to $5 trillion worth of mortgages. This is $5 trillion of liquidity that is going to come into the market if you allow these two organizations to get back to business as usual. And so here are the fucking maths. Where do I get this idea that Bitcoin could hit a million dollars? So if we think about QE for poor people, banks lending more into the real economy, I estimate that that could be up to $3 trillion of bank credit that will be created between now and 2028. The statistic to look for is on the weekly Federal Reserve balance sheet, other deposits and liabilities. We'll see that happening there. If the banks are allowed to buy treasury bonds, it's estimated that $900 billion of foreign demand could evaporate. 
And that has to be replaced by commercial banks who now can buy these treasuries with infinite leverage. And finally, let's free Fannie and Freddie and bring $5 trillion of liquidity to the markets, which gets us close to $9 trillion printed or between now and 2028. And let's put this into context. During COVID, the COVID stimulus programs and all the aid that was given to the financial sector within the United States totaled about $4 trillion. And from the lows of March of 2020 to 70,000 in 2021 in November, we went up about 10x. Remember, price is set on the margin. It matters about the much larger marginal price, not the whole stock. And so we, if we have less Bitcoin on exchanges due to ETF demand, and we're printing double the amount of money between now and 2028 than what we did till COVID, then Bitcoin $1 million is just easy. Thank you very much. Hope to see you all at our party tonight. <laughs>